Um, so my name is Adrian. I'm a this this isn't. I'm not a. I don't have any formal role in the in the environmental fields or or ecology. I'm a. Uh, up until two months ago, I was a public health uh, epidemiologist um, working in the NHS. Uh, so I do have a science background. This kind of thing, you can't look at it from one specialty. It's it crosses so many different science specialisms. And over the last couple of years, I've I've really spent most of my time learning about anthropology, ecology, climate change, um, all these different fields that intersect. We, we really focus on climate change a lot, but there's so much more, I think, to the human predicaments than climate change. And, and I think that's a lot of the work I'm doing now is around communicating about all these different aspects. Um, climate change, of course, is a big one, but, but of course, uh, biodiversity loss, agriculture, um, econ economics, all these things. So thank you for introducing yourself. So what I'm hoping to, uh, to, to take out of this is for, for us to be able to understand, number one, what the issues are, um, as, as Lindsay is wanting to say, you know, we're really interested in what can we do? We, you know, we, the situation is terrible. We know that and we're going to find out. But what what can we do? And particularly as churches that are pretty good at doing community uh, to begin to create the resilient communities uh, to, to, to face the challenges going forward. So I'd really appreciate if you could share that. Uh, absolutely. So I've pulled some slides together just to just to keep the narrative focused it's it's in two parts so uh, so pretty much the first i'd say probably 60 percent is around pulling all the different threads of the of our human predicament together um to kind of set the scene really and in, and in the last section i talk about responses and of course i'm, st I'm standing on the shoulders of giants as well uh, um uh, like michael dowd um the 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 reverend from the states he did a, a a lot of traveling around the states delivering sermons um on the ecological predicament so, so i'll point you to some of his resources at the end because that will probably be very very useful for you guys in terms of uh, communicating um this stuff um, and, and of course, a, a lot of ecologists, but a, a lot of this is deeply personal as well. When, well, once I've done my presentation, um, you know, you'll, you'll kind of see where I am and where uh, increasingly more and more people are arriving at. Um, and then how, how do you respond to that? How do you respond to something so absolutely vast? Excellent, excellent. So, yeah, so the, 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 this presentation is just called uh, Understanding Civilizational Collapse and, and How We Can Respond. And, and this really is at quite high level because this is such a massive field. And as I said, there's so many disciplines that intersect here. I've tried to keep it to the really kind of key points. And, and I've got some resources to share at the end so, so people can go and, and look a bit a bit further into things. So when I talk about this stuff, I always say that there's, there's some concepts and data here that can hit you pretty hard if it's the first time you've heard it. So do reach out to someone if, if you do struggle with any of the this, this stuff. It's, certainly don't deal with it on your own. Um, and then there's, there's lot, you, know, you guys are ahead of the curve, obviously, when it comes to community. Um, but there's lots of resources and groups online as well where, where this, people are talking about this kind of thing and, and their experiences. So, so my, my thesis, so I'm, my thesis is global industrial civilization is collapsing due to ecological overshoot of carrying capacity. And, and I'll unpick that in a moment. But although we can expect the future to become increasingly difficult for humanity and all life on earth, there are ways that we can respond positively to our predicaments. We can embrace positive life ways that will increase personal and community resilience and support local biodiversity, even as even as collapse unfolds. So, so ecological overshoot is, is, is essentially when you have too many people on the planet consuming too much, and they're consuming more than the earth can can regenerate within a year. Um, but not just using all the resources the earth provides, but also polluting it beyond its capacity to absorb it. 
Um, and, and this quote, this, this is this is just I, I, I say this. <laughs> We're drawing down resources such as fossil fuels, metals, fresh water, and minerals that took millions of years to form but we're drawing them down in the space of decades. So far, far too, too quickly, far, far more quickly than they are able to regenerate. So this is, this is a kind of a, a, a simplification, but really, really useful way of describing ecological overshoot. So imagine a pair of goldfish in a small bowl. At first, there's plenty of clean water, space and oxygen. So the fish are thriving, but as time passes, the goldfish start to reproduce. Each new generation adds more fish to the bowl, increasing the demand for resources and producing more waste. Eventually, there are too many fish for the bowl's limited space and water capacity. The water becomes polluted faster than it can be cleaned. Oxygen levels drop and food becomes scarce. This leads to a collapse in the goldfish population as the bowl simply can't support so many fish. So that is essentially what we call ecological overshoot. So just like the goldfish in the bowl, we are reproducing and consuming resources in a finite bowl, our planet, the Earth. When a population grows beyond what the environment can sustainably support, it leads to resource depletion and environmental strain, ultimately threatening the survival of the population itself. So this is just, we don't need to spend too much time on this, but this is essentially ecological overshoot in, in, in graph form. So what you can see is, is uh, on, on, the, uh, on this axis here, the human ecological footprint, so our pollution and resource consumption, and then the duration of civilization along the bottom there. And where it says exponential economic growth, that, that also means growth of uh, the population. So let's just say the Earth can sustain 1 million humans in perpetuity. So the carrying capacity, of, it, that, that isn't the carrying capacity, but let's just use that for an example. So the carrying capacity we're saying is one million humans. So all the time there are under a million humans, we are under the carry, carrying capacity. The, the earth can sustainably support that one million population. As soon as, you, one, as soon as you're at one million and one humans and increasing, you are in ecological overshoot. So that is space where you're consuming um, the consuming and polluting beyond the Earth's ability to regenerate and deal with that pollution. The problem is, is that at certain points you will start to see a die-off in the population because there's not enough food, there's too much pollution, not enough fresh water. So then you then you experience a, a, a die-off in population. Now you might think, well, when the human when the, the humans decrease to one million again, then it will balance out. Well, that doesn't happen. What happens is that once you spend time in that overshoot of carrying capacity, you degrade the environment. And so it can't even support the original number of people. And that's that's the loss of carrying capacity. It's it's a, it's not, you know, it's quite a quite a cold way of, of looking at it, but that is essentially how ecological overshoot works and our civilization global industrial civilization the the modern interconnected world that we live in today has been in ecological overshoot since 1970 so over over 50 years we've been consuming beyond the the planet's ability to regenerate and deal with pollution so these are these are these are signs of ecological overshoot, and and this really is is undeniable. This is all, all in the scientific literature. So um, resource depletion. So so we sometimes call them ecosystem services. The things the earth provides are things like fresh water and fertile soil and forests and those kinds of things. So we're, we're depleting fossil fuels. Um, is broadly considered we hit peak oil about two thousand and fifteen, and we've had all the good oil out of the ground. Now we're with fracking, getting all the kind of the crappier oil out of the ground. It's kind of it's like when you when you're sucking a milkshake in a straw and you get get to the last bit at the bottom. That's kind of where we are with uh, with oil. Um, fresh water aquifers are being depleted, and, and of course in the UK we we have a problem with um, waste in, in our rivers. Uh, soil erosion from industrial agriculture, where we pump it full of fertilizer and pesticides that essentially destroys um, the soil and leads to desertific desertification 
uh, deforestation, deforestation is a problem in the UK and, and every country around the world. And of course, biodiversity loss. Then, of course, there's climate change. Uh, we have rising global temperatures, uh, extreme weather events, uh, agriculture failure, um, which leads to inflation and disrupted ecosystems. And then pollution and waste. Um, we have plastic waste, chemical pollution and air quality issues. So I think most people would recognize that we are those are all problems we're dealing with and they all stem from ecological overshoot. So how, how do we know our civilization is in decline? Well, we again, it's it's in the scientific literature, in the public, in oh, it's all in the public domain. So so food insecurity, water scarcity, political instability, rising inequality, public service failure, and reduction in life expectancy. So again, we recognise all of those things in the UK and also all, all around the world. So in in the UK. 800 million people go to bed hungry every night. This year, crop yields are down 20%, which leads to us importing more goods, driving up costs. And men in East Sussex, where, where I'm from, men are dying 200 days younger on average than 10 years ago. So for the first time ever, we, we are, well, the first time in you know, modern medicine history, we are seeing... Um, mortality rates go in the wrong direction and for, and for me as obviously as an epidemiologist that that's a real that's the real clangor for me but um you know that that is incontrovertible proof really that things are going in the wrong direction and of course waiting times for cancer diagnostic surgery and common musculoskeletal surgeries are, are, are going into multiple years now if you want to Typically in the UK, if you want a hip replacement or you need, need a hip replacement or a knee replacement now, you're often waiting more than two years. Um, just five years ago, that, that no one would have believed um, that that's the trajectory we were on. So global population and consumption trends. So we are seeing a rapid increase in, in population still, not, not, as, not as fast as it was. Um, I say now approaching 8 billion, we're actually at 8.2 billion humans on the planet now in the 1960s the doubling time of global population was 35 years i've got a chart in a minute that, that shows those numbers in quite a shocking way and of course um there, there's massive consumption disparities um, high consumption lifestyles of wealthy nations versus scarcity in poorer regions and i'll talk about ecological footprints a little bit in a minute and 4 billion humans dependent on industrial agriculture, which, which requires natural gas for fertilizer, oil for pesticides, and aquifers for water, all of which are running out. That is a huge problem. That those 4 billion people are the, in, the, in the wealthiest half of the world, because most people in the poorer half of the world are subsistence farmers. We are entirely dependent on industrial agriculture for for our calories and as soon as we don't have access to that gas for fertilizer and oil for pesticide well you you you, you can take a guess at, at what happens then so this is this is this show this shows the size of the world population over the last twelve thousand years and I, I remember when i first saw this graph or a similar graph a couple of years ago my, you know my jaw hit the ground our population isn't natural. We should not be at 8.2 billion humans. You can see here, uh, 10,000 10, years uh, before Common Era, which is broadly when, in, when agriculture started, before that we were hunter-gatherers. And you can see actually over the subsequent 10,000 years, the, the population pretty much stays the same. But the Industrial Revolution, <laughs> beginning in the late 18th century, fundamentally changed how humans lived and worked. We, we almost became a different species. So advancements in technology and energy use, particularly the shift from muscle and animal power to coal and fossil fuels, allowed for massive increases in productivity and efficiency. So those changes led to improved food production, better sanitation, medical advances that reduced mortality rates, Together, those factors contributed to rapid population growth as more people could be supported with fewer resources per person. The population explosion since then has largely been driven by abundant energy 
and the technological industrial innovations that essentially temporarily expanded the carry, our carrying capacity. I say temporarily expanded the car carrying capacity because those resources are temporary. We have a finite amount of fossil fuels and when they're gone, that, that temporary carrying capacity goes. I want to say now it's important to understand that all species will go into overshoot given the resources and opportunity. This isn't unique to humans, but this is the first time this has happened globally. You know, locally species will go into, into overshoot if there's abundant food, and then they will have to have a massive die off when that food runs out. This is the first time this has happened globally. Um, just won't dwell on this for too, too long, but it's essentially there's a, a, a network called the, uh, the Global uh, Ecological Footprint Network, and they essentially mapped the, the resource consumption lifestyles at different parts of the world and said how, how many Earths you would need to satisfy those levels of consumption and pollution. So if everyone in the world lived like people in North America do, you would need 5.1 Earths to cater to their needs. Um, we've, sp we've spoken about industrial agriculture, so we don't, we don't need to dwell here too much, but industrial agriculture does not work without fossil fuels and, and half the world's population is completely dependent on it. And, and this, is, this is the thing that's, I think that, that scares me the most. So, so why, why aren't policies, policy solutions enough? But we can see things like COP aren't, aren't working because, because they end in unenforceable agreements. Um, they, they get watered down, and even after they've been watered down, they're not even enforceable. So, so, so what, what, good, what good is that? Um, we have a short-term focus. So in the UK government, constantly talking about economic growth. Well, if you're, if you're somebody who has an ecological understanding and, and, and understand that you cannot have infant growth on a finite planet, it, 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 feels, like, um, it feels like living in, a, in another dimension sometimes. And this is, I really like this graph because you see the black line shows the amount of uh, fossil fuels being burnt year on year. The red line is CO2 emissions and you have all the COPs for each year mapped against the rising CO2 and the rising amount of fossil fuels being burned. Um, so Earth's energy imbalance, so that's the difference between the amount of energy from the sun that reaches Earth and then the amount that's reflected back into space. And this is, for a lot of scientists, a key metric for, for assessing how well the world is responding to climate change. And you can see from, from 150,000 years ago onwards, it's, you know, the, the glacial and interglacial periods, it, it doesn't stay too far from zero, it fluctuates up and down. You can see now where, where we are, you've got this hockey stick curve. Um, we have, we have, you know, th this is freaking a lot of people out because this has never happened before. So nobody knows what the impact of this is beyond accelerating the rate of global warming. This is uncharted territory. Um, there's no way. There's no way you can stop that. There's the, the Thwaites Glacier with the amount of warming we're committed to already we, will melt. We know that's gone. It's sometimes called the Doomsday Glacier. So we know that 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 feedback loop and the Earth's energy imbalance is is a huge problem for us now and going forward. So I've, I've, I've called this the big lie of the, of the energy transition. So energy consumption by, by source. So you can see that still 85% of our energy comes from fossil fuels. So the, the reason I call it the big lie of the energy transition is because solar, wind, and hydro are not replacing oil, gas, and coal. They are being added to. Our economies are still growing. Growing economies need a constant increase in the in the rate of energy consumption, and so all those renewables are simply powering economic growth. They are not replacing fossil fuels; they're just enabling our economies to to grow. And so, people when they say Chinese are, China is a mass investor in, in renewables, they are, they are, but it's not it's not a green transition. They just need uh, more energy to to grow their economy. Um, 
This is this is the last slide from this part of the of the talk before I start talking about responses. And I suppose this is this is the sad this is the saddest um, part of what's happened by expanding the human enterprise quite so drastically as we have 10,000 10, years ago. This is but this is by weight of all vertebrate land mammals on Earth. 10,000 years ago, there were 1% humans on the planet, 99% wild animals. And today, it's 32% humans, 67% pigs, sheep, and cows, you know, animals we eat, and 1% wild animals. Um, so, so living with purpose in uncertain times. So, so I, I became collapse aware about two years ago. I, I, I marched with Extinction Rebellion for about six years prior to that and i was becoming increasingly sus suspicious um, that things weren't working things weren't going in the right direction and then i thought something just felt wrong people, people kept on talking about technological solutions but i was just i saw co2 was still increasing um pollution was still increasing i and then i became just began reading more and more about things and really went down the rabbit hole so to speak following a lot of mainstream environmentalists like george like george monbio and they were all saying we're screwed but then they would right on the end they would say all we need to do is use this technology or, or that technology so so i think re reconnecting with nature adopting much more simple lives spending time outdoors and protecting local ecosystems. I'll, I'll talk a bit more in a minute about, about how, I, how I practice this kind of thing. Build, building communities, so sharing resources, skills, and knowledge with others in your church and community. Like, like I said, you guys are kind of ahead of the curve there. It, it, that's the bit where most people struggle because we become so atomized as a, as a society um, that, that that's, that's really the kicker for a lot, for a lot of people. And, and reduce consumption, eating locally, healthily, using public transport, only buy what you really need, travel less. These, these are all, these won't make any difference. These, these won't save the planet, but they're the right thing to do. So res responding to collapse and embracing resilience. So the, these are things, these are things that I think are, are essential that individually and as as communities um, as we as things really kind of go into go into the decline so le learn new skills like gardening food preservation and energy conservation um, practical skills carpentry mechanics plumbing diy first aid i am i had a i had a, a toilet dripping the other day and I, and I fixed it myself trying to become a bit more handy um, community resilience, supporting local networks, sharing resources, community building. So, this is something called pro-social prepping. I, I don't know if it, it's quite it's quite niche, but essentially it's it's like the emergency preparedness. But you're not doing it for yourself, like you know, like you know, all the people buying loo rolls during COVID. It's it's kind of um, you know making sure that uh, you've got skills and resources for 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 your community, your family, the people in your life. And then your basic prepping, emergency preparedness is important. Um, so having three weeks or three months worth of food in, you know, long life food, batteries, torches, you know, bug out bags in case you have to leave home, like a tent, a sleeping bag. Um, you know, if, you're, if your home floods, which is, you know, it's in some areas of this country, a, a real risk. Um, if we get massive uh, precipitation, uh, having power banks to charge your phones um, and water and, and water filtration. I think I think I'm getting yeah I'm clo getting close to the end. Um, mental health and well being. This this is this is really really key. And I've been looking to, into this uh, a lot recently. And I did a a big kind of a mini essay uh, on online about this recently. So starting with with cognitive dissonance, is that you know a lot of people are starting to think things aren't going in the right direction with the environment and the economy, but it's hard, you know, facing this stuff, you know, it's a, it's a bit, it's a bit masochistic, really. It's, you know, it's not, e it's not easy stuff, but I think overcoming cognitive distance is, is very important first step. And, and then, and then grief. Um, I, I definitely went through grief. Um, you, you know, you, when when you when you realise the impact we've had on the natural world and uh, the impact 
that humans yeah that humans are having on the on the, the impact humans are having on the natural world and that things aren't going to get better they're going to continue decline we don't know exactly the rate of decline if anybody's anybody tries to tell you they do then then they're they're foolish or, or lying because our systems are so complex you cannot you cannot say for certain so re responding to that that's the mindfulness the pro social prepping resilience through reframing not looking at it as, as a problem but, but a challenge to you know, an opportunity to reconnect with nature and adopt regenerative practices. Uh, I grow and store some of my food. Prior to two years ago, I'd never grown a single thing. I gave up eating meat because when I understood the impact of uh, animal agriculture on on emissions, that's why I gave it up. But I've been over years. I, I just don't fancy eating animals anymore. I, I, I left my job two months ago um, and now I'm studying for my permaculture design certificate. I feed the critters and, and I've rewilded my back garden. Um, so, so I've got some stables at the bottom behind. I mean, it, it looks an absolute mess, but it's just full of, of so much wildlife. Um, so so uh, inclusion and call to action. While our civilization faces real challenges, our response can reflect our deepest values, which I think for most of us is caring for all life on this blue-green earth. There are practical, small practical steps each person can take, reducing waste, growing food, supporting local businesses, biodiversity, building community. And here's some resources. This is the last slide. Here's a couple of just resources. So, and Michael Dowd, Reverend Michael Dowd, who, who a lot a lot of people who who share my my view of collapse and overshoot really really look up to. Um, he's done so many videos um, about collapse and overshoot. But, um, but yeah, there's resources, and I'm happy to share these slides as well. And I'll get I'll get Kevin's email. I'll send them over, and then and then you can use them. Thank you. That's it.